Okay, so let me start. Um, so welcome. And of course, you know, it's so much nicer if I could be there in India and uh, be there in person. It's a whole different world. But uh, by now we kind of uh, got used to do this um, Zoom talks, which is like, in a way it's so weird, right? I'm sitting in my, alone in my office. I close the door so nobody can hear me. And I talk into the computer and I assume that somewhere in the other part of the world, <laughs> some 60 something, roughly 60 people who are actually listening to me. So I hope that is really the case. So let me start by saying a few things, general remarks. Uh, the hardest thing when you prepare a, a talk in, in such school is to assume what you guys know, okay? So it's very different when I teach a course, then there's an assumption. You say, oh, the, the student should know this, this, and this. And then I come here and I'm not so sure what you know. So let me tell you what assumption I made. And it may be some, so some of you, it's actually, you know much more and some of you, you know less. But I assume that all of you know the basic of quantum field theory and all of you seen the standard model before. And you kind of know what mesons and hadrons are. are. And, but if for some reason I say something that is a little bit um, more advanced, feel free to, to stop me. Um, point number two is please ask questions. This is, of course, if I was there, it would be much uh, simpler. Here, um, you can type them in the chat. And I hope, um, I guess, Jimmy, it would be you that uh, moderate the session. And you can actually stop me, and I will stop myself in, in, in different places and ask uh, and <coughs> let you ask questions. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me. That's my email up there. And I send you some reading stuff. I hope you've been seeing them. Uh, <coughs> Jim, did you able to send them the links that I sent you? Yes, I, I shared this yesterday. So oh, great, thanks. Ho 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 so hopefully. Uh... They, they, they will certainly be able to use that as a reference as, as we go forward, yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's, I sent you two links. One of them is a textbook that uh, Yossi Nier and myself had been written for many years now, and we finally almost ready. When I say almost ready, that means that it's accepted for publication. And we are now doing the last uh, polishing, making pictures, you know, more Feynman diagram and those kind of things. I definitely like the book, otherwise I wouldn't uh, um, write it. So feel free to actually go and read the book and share it, and hopefully you will enjoy it. The other uh, link, link I sent you is a write-up of the TASI lectures that I gave several years ago, which was basically the same as the lectures that I'm giving today. I had I made some changes, and this uh, lecture, these lecture notes are much an extended version of the TASI lecture, and they're also an extended version of what I'm doing today. But everything that I will be doing in this uh, today and tomorrow is in those uh, uh, TASI lectures. And what is the plan for the lecture? I roughly try to do the following four uh, lectures. Today, I'm going to try to do a very rough introduction to what model building and the standard model. I assume you've seen it to some degree, but I find it useful to kind of put it on the same footing and tell you how I see model building and the standard model. Uh, later today, I will hope to talk about the flavor sector of the standard model, in particular on the CKM metrics, which is the metrics for us, flavor physicists. And tomorrow I hope to talk about the flavor change in neutral current and the so-called gene mechanism, uh, that's flavor at one loop and CP violation. Any questions so far? I mean, it's just the introduction, but if you have anything before I start, jumping into the physics. Because when we jump into the physics, start getting a little bit too detailed and hopefully I hear nothing. So I assume there's no question. So let me start with the following exercise. So you look at the PDG and the PDG is an amazing thing, okay? The PDG is the particle data group. And if you never heard about the PDG, you should definitely, definitely uh, look at it at your earlier convenience, basically, like tonight. The particle data group is the place where we basically have all the data that's related to particle physics in one place, okay? And as a physicist, the way I like to see myself as someone who do physics is actually the following thing. I take the particle data group and I interpret it, okay? Somehow, like, you know, people do with the Bible. They take the Bible and interpret it. That's the way I see myself. 
I take the particle data group, I look at this huge amount of data, and I said, well, we as physicists, as particle physicists, we really understand the underlying theory that produce all this amazing data, okay? So what I like you to do now, and I be quiet now for two minutes, and I ask you to do the following thing. I <coughs> copy a few entries from the particle data group, okay? For example, I copy the branching ratio of D plus to K zero bar, L positron and neutrino, which is the quark, the quark transition underlying this uh, decay is C going to S uh, positron and neutrino. The branching ratio is eight times 10 to the minus two. It's roughly 10, uh, almost 10%, uh, okay? And then you do the same with the muon instead of the electron and you find this one, okay? And then you look for BDK and BDK, semi-leptonic BDK, uh, radiative BDK, which is B2S gamma, B2S mu plus mu minus, and you see those branching ratios, okay? And they are all over the place. They are branching ratio for the 10% or 10% here, and there are some that actually go down to 10 to the minus nine, and some branching ratios that are almost all the one, like the K minus DK, 63%, uh, I'm more than half the time the K minus became to a muon and a neutrino, but the K long decay only about 10 to the minus eight, into mu plus and mu minus, okay? So what I'm asking you to do now, and I've been quiet for two minutes, okay? Is to think what patterns do you see? Can you, I don't asking you to get the model building reasons for this. That's hopefully will be done, next, you know, that's what the aim of my lectures are. But try to tell me what are the, what do you see from the data? Can you actually um, articulate what do we see here, okay? I'll be quiet, please write your answer in the chat. And I will actually look at the chat and I will start right reading the answers, okay? And then I say two minutes starting right now. Please go ahead. You should have put some nice music while you are doing it, but I will not. Just try to do it, okay? I had like a stop clock, stopwatch. Okay, <sighs> great. I see people already start writing stuff, so please keep going, that's great. Okay, two minutes are up, and I'm very happy to see that uh, many of you wrote stuff on the chat. That means that there's actually someone in the other side, and you were listening. So I'm already feel almost as if I'm in India with you guys. And so let me go over those things. And, and I said this is just data. I just put put some data on on you without trying to do any explanation. And let's try to see what people had been written. Okay. By the way, do you see the chat when I share the screen or you don't? I don't know how it is. Is I never did these things on, on Zoom. Okay, so I, I'm gonna read it anyway, okay? So um, one person said, D-leptonic decays are very rare. And D-leptonic decays are this one or this one, okay? So K long to mu plus mu minus and B sub S to mu plus mu minus are 10 to the minus nine. They are much, much more rare than anything else that you see in this table, okay? Very nice. And <clears throat> then someone said that charge current modes are higher branching ratio than neutral current mode. So charge current mode are the current where the quark that we change here have a different charge. For example, C2S, it's a charge current mode because the C and then S has different charge. Or B2C is charge current mode. However, B2S is neutral current mode because the charge of the in and out quark is the same charge. And what you see is indeed that when we have C2S is a branching ratio, it's very large. It's of order 10 to 10%. 10 However, B2S, which neutral, it's 10 to the minus four. Or B2S mu plus mu minus is 10 to the minus nine. Okay? So we already see some patterns here, okay? And B2S electron, C2S electron and C2S muon are very close. If you look at the first two, you see that if I change the electron to muon, almost nothing change in the branching ratio. I mean, within arrows, they are identical, right? So somehow you see that electron and muon, I don't really care in some cases if I have electron or muon, okay? And D-leptonic decays are rare. That's already people said. The double muon decay are rare. Different crowd transition are suppressed depending on the distance between the generation. So if you look at these two modes, okay? B2C muon and B2, uh, I messed up the charges, of course, but forget about my typo here. B2U and B2C, you, 
you see something interesting that B2C is of order 10 to the minus two and B2U is of order 10 to the minus four. So somehow when I go from cell to second, I have branching ratio that is much bigger than when I go from cell to first generation, okay? Um, let's see, I think we cover everything. This data show probability of a particle by specific decay mode is depend on the generation involving the transition. B2U is suppressed compared to BTC. Yes, that's what I was just saying. Um, flavor change in neutral current are suppressed. Um, okay, so let me move on. Let me close the chat for now. And I'm very happy that you kind of saw what I was aiming at. And let me summarize what we see from the data. And we see the following three things from the data I show you. One is called lepton universality. We don't really care if it's an electron or muon when we look at B decays. And in charm decay, and it's also actually in B decays. Okay? So there's some caveat to, basically to everything I said, a caveat, but basically we see something interesting that I don't care much about if it's an electron or a muon. The other thing that we see that flavor change in neutral currents are small, they are much smaller than uh, charge current interaction, okay? So we just see that B2C is much higher than B2S. And we see the generation hierarchy. We see that uh, B2C is much higher than B2U, okay? So I already, I, what I really want to emphasize in this point is that we came from the data. When we do physics, the data is what tell us what we are doing, okay? So all those nice, really, really cool things that we are going to discuss about the standard model and all this, beautiful theory behind it, it's actually there in order to explain this really, really uh, vast amount of data that we have. And we start seeing pattern in the data and then we have to explain it, okay? And my hope is that by tomorrow afternoon, after I will done, you will have a much better understanding of those features and where they are coming from and how we are building them up. Okay, any questions so far? Again, I assume there's no questions, so let me move on. And what I wanna do now is I'm gonna do a very brief introduction of um, the standard model and model building. And the first question, which is actually the question that all of us should ask ourselves is what is high energy physics? I mean, we are here, we are doing high energy physics. So what is our big aim in, um, in what we are doing? And I find that the answer I provide is that high energy physics, the idea is to find the basic laws of nature. And I like to emphasize that this is different from what other parts of physics and if, even like other parts of sciences are doing. So if you look at what uh, people who do condensed matter, they're actually taking the fundamental laws, which is basically Maxwell equation and Schrodinger equation. And then they see how this seemingly simple equation give us this amazing phenomena that we see in condensed matter. We ask a different question. We don't ask the question, giving the laws what we get, we really try to understand what are these laws. And more formally, what we are asking is what is the Lagrangian? I really like this equation. It's like the shortest, most precise way for us to explain what we are doing. Of course, in order to understand this explanation, this equation, you have to know what this symbol is. And that's of course a big deal. But once you are actually a physicist and you understand what the Lagrangian is, then this is what we are after. We try to understand what is the law of nature. And we have a quite good answer. We actually have an amazing answer to most of it. And it's based on axiom and symmetries. It's really not an ad hoc. It's very nicely mathematically formulated. And the way I like to think about high energy physics is about it, to think about it as analytical mechanics too. And I, when I took analytical mechanics, it was the biggest wow of my life. It was wow, that's so amazing. And particle physics, is basically just analytical mechanics, just deeper. It's analytical mechanics too. You take your basic axiom, you take your generalized coordinate. In classical mechanics, your generalized coordinates are just the positions of the particle. In quantum field, the generalized coordinates are field, but it's the same idea. Then you write the Lagrangian, you get the equation of motion, and you go for there, okay? And particle physics, what we are doing, the particles are there in order to help us to answer the question, of what is the Lagrangian. And then we move to the idea of uh, model building or how do we build Lagrangian? We call it model building, but it's a little bit uh, understatement. I, I think we should have called it a 
model designers, how we design a model, okay? So this is the way we are actually thinking about a model, a theory that explain nature, okay? You choose your generalized coordinate, you choose what are the players, which is in quantum field, you are the field, you choose them. Then you impose symmetries and you say how the field transpose under those symmetry. Like in analytical mechanics, we are doing it like this. We are saying, oh, I have a particle and a particle transform as a vector under rotation, right? Or we have uh, the mass and the mass transform just like a, a, a scalar under rotation. In quantum field theory, we put all our field and say how they transform. They can be scalar, vectors, whatever it is under the symmetries that we impose, okay? And then we do the thing, uh, it's called the democratic principle. And the democratic principle tell us that the Lagrangian is the most general one that obeys the symmetry. That is, everything that is allowed should be there. If it's not, the only reason for something not to be there because it's, ex it's explicitly forbidden. This is in opposite to what we call the totalitarian picture, uh, principle, where everything is forbidden unless it's explicitly allowed, okay? And <clears throat> that's the way we are doing physics. We say everything that if I can write a term that is invariant under my symmetries, it should be there in the Lagrangian. And then we do something that we love to do as physicists. We love to truncate functions, okay? And if you think that's what we do in physics all the time, you take your Lagrangian, you write it as a power series of a small parameter, and we truncate. Usually we truncate it at a fourth order. There's uh, some reason to do it, which has to do with renormalizability, but I don't care too much about renorm renormalizability. What I really care about at this point is that at fourth order, it's explained the data. And that's how we do physics, right? You expand and you measure. Once you measure more and more precise, you need to go to higher and higher order. That's how we learn physics from first grade or kindergarten, whenever you start learning physics, right? You write your approximation. Then if it's uh, uh, <clears throat> not good enough, you keep going and you go higher and higher holder, okay? And so, so, this so, truncation- So Yuval, sorry yes. to interrupt, but there was a question. Yes. When you say yes, fourth please, order, in, in yes. what parameter are they? Oh, in the, the field, question. okay, okay. Okay, in, thank in, you, yeah. thank you. I, I wasn't uh, clear enough. So let's come back to um, analytical mechanics. And let's think that in analytical mechanics, let's take the pendulum, okay? And in the pendulum, the a generalized coordinate that we really try to solve is the angle theta, right? It's a one-dimensional question. It's a um, 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 planar pendulum. And what we do, we rewrite our Lagrangian. In the Lagrangian, the, we have something like cosine theta. And then we expand cosine theta, right? We write one minus theta squared over two plus theta to the four over 24, et cetera, right? And in analytical mechanics, in the question of the pendulum, what we do the first time, the first time we truncate at second order, right? And then we get the harmonic oscillator. And then if we try to kind of what we call the non-harmonic terms, we go to the theta to the four term, et cetera. In, in, when we built Lagrangian, it's exactly the same point, but our generalized coordinates are the field. So something that go like phi squared, that's what we call a mass term. That's the, usually it's the equivalent of the theta squared of the pendulum, okay? And then we have say phi cube and phi to the four, and these are the higher order term that we have in the pendulum, okay? So when we build Lagrangian, the expansion parameter is our uh, generalized coordinate, and we assume that it is small. We have small oscillation around the minimum, just like when we have a pendulum and we assume small oscillation of the pendulum around the equivalent, the equivalent the, ah, <laughs> around its minima, around its minimum. Okay, hopefully it, uh, it was clear. And what I wanted to say is that this truncation may result in accidental symmetries. And I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I just want to say that accidental symmetries are those symmetries where they are not input to the theory, they are an output to the theory and they result only due to the truncation. In the standard model, those accidental symmetry are lepton and baryon number. And we know that baryon number is not an imposed symmetry, it's an output symmetry just because of the truncation. If you keep up to a right term up to dimension six that involves six fields in our Lagrangian, then you don't have baryon number as a symmetry anymore. Accidental symmetry are symmetry that are an output, which are different than the symmetry that we impose like uh, SU3 cos SU2 cos U1.
Okay, I see no more questions, so let me move on. And now we'll go to the standard model. The standard model is a totally um, an amazing achievement of humans, okay? It's, I feel it's totally underappreciated by so many people, including so many in our field. And I don't know how many times you've seen people say, oh, we make this measurement and it's agree with the standard model. Okay, too bad. And for me, the other, it's another thing, wow. We as physicists were able to write a theory that can predict these really crazy things and we keep checking it and they run these crazy machines and we keep seeing that it's working. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing achievement, okay? The name again is so the standard model. I mean, it sounds like benign something. Okay, you know, you have some nice model, but it's much deeper. It's an amazing theory. It's the best theory that humankind had ever been written that actually explained nature, okay? Something that people from, you know, from the, all the Greeks and Egyptians were trying to do, and we are actually keeping doing it, and we are getting better and better and better in the answer, okay? A little philosophy, but uh, for me, it's like an amazing thing. So let's see how we do this amazing theory. So we just told you how you buy real Lagrangian. You have to put symmetries and fields as input. So what are the symmetries? The symmetry is the four-dimensional Poincaré invariant, which is Lorentz invariant plus translation. And the internal symmetry is SU3 cos SU2 cos U1. And as I said, I assume you've seen it before, but I just want to say it again. And what are the fields that we put? What are the generalized coordinates that we put into the story? We have three co co copies of the fermion, but we call them the cudel. See how nice it is, cudel, something like, so cute, you like cuddle them, right? Our cudel. Okay, you took the three cudels, which are the uh, quarks, the doublet, the Q left, the left-handed fields are doublet, and the right-handed fermions are singlet, and we have an up and down, and the leptons that we have a doublet of the lepton that is not charged under SU3, it's a singlet under SU3, and we have the E right. Um, if you never seen this notation, let me just say it. What we, this notation means is that this is the name of the field, this is the representation under SU3, which is three minutes a, a fundamental of SU3. This is the representation under SU2. That means it's a doublet of SU2. And this is the charge under U1Y, the hypercharge, okay? And we have one scalar, which is the Higgs field, which is a doublet of SU2 and have some hypercharge, and it's a singlet under SU3. That's it. We define the standard model. Now you just put it in your machine. You write the most general Lagrangian, truncated dimension four, and you have the equation of motion, you know how to write Feynman diagram, and that's it. In principle, in principle, that's enough. You can actually put it in a computer code and the computer will tell you everything, in principle. In practice, it's much more complicated, okay? But in principle, we know what to do from this point on. So then what we do, we write the Lagrangian and we can write the Lagrangian as a sum of three terms, the kinetic terms, which involve all the derivative, including the covariant derivative, the Higgs interaction, also known as the vector, as the scalar potential, and the Yukawa interaction that involve both scalars and fermions, okay? It have an accidental symmetry, which is bio numbers times the three lepton numbers. And what we need to do now is to actually do some measurements to find the parameter. And once we find the parameter, we find that this model has spontaneous symmetry breaking, SU2 cross U1 down to U1 electromagnetism. And we measure the fermion mass, the gauge coupling, and mixing angle. And once we know all these parameters, we actually can start test the model. So we have to make 18 measurements to measure those 18 parameters. And then from the 19th measurement on, we actually test the model. And we did thousands of measurements by now, okay? And almost all of them, the standard model passed in flying colors, in amazing things. There's some little things here and there, and I will mention them as we go on. But Looking at the big picture, it's an amazing success, okay? It's really an amazing success. Before I move on, I want to uh, introduce a notation, which I call the A standard model versus the standard model. And what is the difference between a standard model and the standard model? A standard model is a theory without the value of the parameter. So what I wrote to you is a standard model, just a theory that I tell you what are the symmetries of the theory and what are the fields in this theory. 
but I didn't tell you what are the value of the parameter. I didn't tell you what alpha is. A standard model could be a standard model with alpha equal actually three or alpha equal 10 to the minus 20. So it, it is the same model, the same uh, symmetries, the same field. However, the value of the parameter would be different. Okay, a standard model is a generic name for all the theories that have the same structure as what we see. This standard model is the one that we have with a given set of values for the parameters. So this standard model is our world, is the theory that I tell you with alpha equal roughly one over 137, and the mass of the electron is roughly 511 keV, and the mass of the muon is roughly 106 MeV, and the mass of the B meson is roughly 5280 MeV. Okay? So you see the difference. And it's very important when we do model building, when we understand physics, is to understand what predictions are generic to any standard model, to any theory that have the same uh, symmetries and fields as our world, and what comes from the specific values of the parameters in our world, okay? For example, the fact that we can actually use a QED and calculate the hydrogen atom to very high precision has to do with the fact the alpha is extremely small. It's one over 137, okay? If we had a world where alpha electromagnetism were two, we will not be able to do a perturbation theory on the hydrogen atom, okay? So I will tell you the fact that we can actually do a, a fine, a <clears throat> Maxwell equation and all those kind of things has to do with the explicit value of the parameter alpha. It's not a generic prediction of, the, of any standard model, okay? So as we go on, we will understand what are the differences. And I found it very useful to understand what's come from the structure of the standard model and what's come from the value of the parameters of the standard model. Any questions so far? If you have a question, I said, write them on the chat and Jim will interrupt me and ask me. So I assume nothing. So what I'm gonna do next is gonna be somewhat boring in the sense that I'm going to actually go a little bit details into the standard model. As I said, I assume you've seen it before. I still want to do it. I will be a little fast, it, and, but I want to emphasize a few points that will be import, important as we go on and we try to understand flavor in the standard model. So let me start with the gauge interaction. As I said, we wrote the standard model. We wrote a standard model, and now we try to uh, start understanding what all those terms tell us. So. What we have in the gauge interaction? What we have is the following. We have SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. That is broken down to SU3 cross U1 electromagnetism. And what is interesting is that we have these three parts, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, that are very different. They start as a, just a gauge theory. And somehow when we see them in nature, they look really, really different. So QED is U1 electromagnetism, is the photon and it's perturbation theory. And that's kind of the standard quantum field theory that we all know and love, or maybe we don't love it too much, but we all should know it, right? Then we have QCD, which is SG3, which is almost like uh, QED with one little different that it's non-abelian. And the non-abelian actually make it, give us the issue of confinement, asymptotic freedom, and strongly coupled theories that we don't know how to do perturbation theory in the infrared. So QED and QCD at the fundamental level, they look very similar. Yet at the infrared, they look very, very different. And then we have the electro weak part, which is the broken part of the SU2 cross U1. And that gives us massive gauge boson that again, looks very, very different than electromagnetism, which give us the photon, which is massless and give us the long range forces. The short interaction give us short term interaction. And we call them forces. We call the electro weak force or the weak force, but we never really use it in a, as a force in the, in the sense of the classical force, okay? It's some interaction that is extremely short range and has to do with the massive, with the fact that they are massive, the gauge bosons, okay? I'm not going to talk much about QCD. You're actually going to have a full set of lecture of QCD in flavors. It's extremely interesting, but I will focus on the electro weak parts and the flavor parts that come with it. So, let me say how we are doing it. We write the, um, in order to understand, we write the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian involves the covariant derivative. And the covariant derivative, it's kind of nice because we call it the kinetic term, but actually that's where the interaction comes from. 
okay? It's kind of a, a, a word that changed their meaning. When you start in analytical mechanics, what was the kinetic term? The kinetic term was your time derivative, you remember? The kinetic term was mv squared over two, and v has to do with the dx dt. Kinetic has to do with velocity. And then you go to quantum field theory, and in quantum field theory, the kinetic term become instead of just the, the, the time derivative, it become the x nu derivative. Well, it's maybe not a big surprise because when we move from one dimension into uh, relativity, we kind of think about space time as four time dimension. That is actually a really interesting point. And many times when we move to relativity, we think, oh, we can think about time as an extra space dimension. But for me, it's much, much nicer to think about the three space dimension as extra time dimension. And think about relativity as a theory with four time dimensions. And think about it, hopefully it will help you to have a deeper understanding of relativity and quantum field theory. It's much nicer to think about, for me, much nicer to think about uh, x mu as four time dimension. And when you think about x mu as four time dimension, then you know what the kinetic term is. The kinetic term is not just d to dt, it's d to dx mu, okay? That's really nice. And then we actually move on and define the covariant derivative and the covariant derivative involves the gauge field and the gauge field has the w and y in the SU2 cross u1. So we end up that the covariant derivative terms in the standard in, in classical mechanics is promoted into a term that actually involves some interaction when we move on into the standard model, okay? And it has two parameters, g and g prime, and the d mu is di different depending on the field that is work on. For example, if I work on the, when the d mu work on the lepton doublet, I have here the Pauli matrices that are the generators of the, because it's a doublet, and this uh, half is the fact that it's a, this one over two, is the fact that the hypercharge of the, le of the L field is half. And this is when you do it on the right and the lepton, then it doesn't have a W interaction because it's a singlet and the coupling to the B mu is proportional to G prime because the hypercharge of E is one. Let's move to talk about photon symmetry breaking in the standard model. This come from the Higgs uh, potential and the Higgs potential is the famous Mexican head potential. And I want to emphasize that when we write the Lagrangian, we don't know the sign of mu squared. This is a measurement. We measure the value of mu squared and we measure the value to be a positive. And by measuring mu squared to be positive, we know that we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, so that's our first example of the difference between a standard model and the standard model. In a standard model, we could or we could not have spontaneous symmetry breaking. In the standard model, the one that we have in nature, we see that we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay. And the minimum is called the VEV, V, and we choose it to be in the phi three dimension. It's totally arbitrary choice. That's the deepness of spontaneous symmetry breaking. You choose it wherever you like, and then we, you keep going, but you have to make a choice. And it leads us to a, the, the spontaneous symmetry breaking of SU2 cross U1 down to U1 electromagnetism. And <clears throat> we left with one uh, scalar, and this scalar is what we call the Higgs uh, uh, boson. So what is QED? QED is part of the broken symmetry and the charge, electric charge of any field is the sum of the T3 and the Y of the field. For example, if I write the, my L as a doublet, the top component is the neutrino because what is the electric charge? The T3 is half and Y is minus half. So half minus a half is zero. What is the charge of L? -L? Okay is minus half because it's the bottom component, minus half from hypercharge, that's minus one, okay? And because of spontaneous symmetry breaking, we can tell the difference between the up and down component of the doublet. Okay, so that's where the interaction, let me move on and discuss the spectrum of the theory. And the gauge bosons are in the unbroken before we talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking, we have W1, W2, W3, because they were triplet and the B, the, uh, the hypercharge. And we get them from the covariant derivative after the phi get a wave. 
If you never did this exercise, do yourself a favor and just do it, okay? What you do, do you write instead of phi, you write the VEV, and then you actually expand this dim u phi, and you see what are the masses that you get. And what you find, you find that you have the mass of the W, the mass of the Z, and one massless gauge boson, which you identify as the, as the um, photon, okay? And then we find the theta W, which is the ratio between a, G prime and G. And this theta W is actually the rotation in the basis between the W3 and the B and the Z and A. And that's the first time that we see a basis rotation, but we're going to see many of those. Basis rotation are so fundamental in physics and so fundamental in high energy physics. Okay? This is this theta W. If you think about theta W as a rotation between the W3B to an ZA basis. It's just a basis rotation. Okay? And out of this, we get one relation. It's called the rho equal one relation. That is the relation between the mass of the W and the Z and theta W. And theta W is something that has to do with interactions. And the mass of the W and the Z has to do with the spectrum. So a priori, they are totally unrelated. But somehow, in the standard model in nature, they are actually give equal to one. And that's a signal of spontaneous symmetry breaking. A general statement about spontaneous symmetry breaking is that it's a give relation between parameters that looks as if they are unrelated. And that's the famous rho equal one relation. OK, let me move to lepton masses, and where we start getting into flavor. And now I will slow down a little bit and ask the following question. We cannot write a mass term for the leptons. When you write the, the standard model Lagrangian, there's no mass term for the leptons, OK? And I want to ask you the following question. And again, I'll be quiet for one minute, and I will ask you to write your answer in the chat. Why we cannot write the mass term for the leptons? Let's say, what are the ingredients that we put, OK? A simple answer would be just any mass term would violate the symmetry. But I'd like to ask you a little deeper question. Can you tell what are the ingredients of what it is? What are the so? specific ingredients in the model that um, forbid us to write mass term for the leptons. So again, I'll be quiet for one minute. Please write something in the chat. Okay, time's it up. And I didn't get any responses from, uh, oh, <laughs> it just took time to write. Um, directly writing the mass term will break the gauge symmetry and introduce non-renormalizability. And so, yes, that's exactly correct. And let me elaborate on what you write. What does it mean that it breaks the gauge symmetry and introduce non renormalizability So it's really the fact that when we say, OK, let, OK, more people, let me read what left-handed leptons transfer under SU2 left, but right-handed under U1. Good. Let me explain also this. Let me elaborate on this. Good, I'm happy that you are writing it. You know, and that's really the way. I mean, once you really understand those deep issues, then you understand so much more when, when things are, um, as, we, as we go on. So let me ask, uh, elaborate on those two answers, which are both correct, and I just want to elaborate on them. So we cannot write a mass term just because there's no, we say we write everything that is allowed under the symmetry. You write everything that is allowed and no, no mass term is emerged. That's the answer. And one way to look at it is that to say, oh, what is really the, uh, how they are transformed? And you say, well, in order to have a mass term under the Lorentz, under the Poincaré group, that's a, a property of fermions, the mass term has to be involved something that's transformed like a left-handed and something that's transformed like a right-handed field. So we have to combine a left-handed and a right-handed field, okay? And we can do it in several ways. We can do it in what we call a Dirac field, when the left-handed and the right-handed field are different. Or we can do it in, um, with the same term, which is a Majorana mass, a Majorana fermions, OK? Majorana mass terms we cannot write in the standard model because all the fields in the standard model are charged under the symmetry, or in more, more precisely, they have a complex representation under the field. So a Majorana mass term will violate the symmetry. And why we cannot write a Dirac mass term? Because the theory is what we call a chiral theory. And I want to introduce this notation here. It's chiral theory means that the left-handed and the right-handed field live in a different representation. The left-handed fields are part of a doublet, and the right-handed fields are, part, are singlets, okay? That's very different than QED. In QED, the electron 
both the electron and the anti-electron have a charge plus one and minus one under, under U1, okay? The standard model is a chiral theory. And I like to introduce a not another notation, the difference between a chiral theory and a vectorial theory. A vectorial theory is a theory when the left hand and right handed field have the same um, representation. Good. Thank you for those who wrote. And I hope we understand, you know, asking those deep questions really give us some deep uh, reason why we can do it. So, how do the leptons get mass? They get mass from spontaneous symmetry breaking. That is, they get the mass from the Yukawa term. The Yukawa term is something like L bar E phi. And after the phi acquires a VEV, then this phi become a number. That's the meaning of acquiring a VEV. It's replaced by the minimum. And the minimum is a value. And then something that involves three fields, three fields is not a mass term. It becomes something that involves two fields. And two fields is a mass term. And we get what we call a mass matrix. OK, this is a mass matrix. The mass matrix is some number, the, the time the Yukawa matrix. So the mass matrix is proportional to the Yukawa matrix. OK? And this I and J are what we call flavor indices. That's what all those four lectures are going to be about, about those uh, indices, OK? OK, so what we do when we have a complex three by three matrix, we diagonalize it like we do for any complex matrix that uh, come our way. And when we diagonalize it, we choose a basis where M is diagonal. And the three mass then we call them Me, Mu, and M tau. And they are the mass of the electron muon and tau, OK? The neutrinos are massless because there's no right-handed neutrino in the theory. Why there's no right-handed neutrino? So many people ask me. I don't know if people ask you those questions. But I mean, of course, you could. But you didn't. Why? Because you are the designer. You are the person who put the, the standard model, OK? It's the same question when you make a nice, uh, you know, when, when uh, Leonardo da Vinci did the Mona Lisa, nobody asked him, you know, why the Mona Lisa doesn't have this and this because he is the artist, he decides what to do, right? Same for the standard model. We design the model, we decide what to do, and then we are happy that it actually explained nature, okay? So that was a standard model. I explained you how in a standard model with spontaneous symmetry breaking, we can get lepton masses. Now, let me talk about the fermion masses in the standard model. And here, there's some subtleties. Lepton masses are kind of easy because they're free particles and you know what the mass of the electron mean. In principle, you take the electron and you measure it. This has to do with the fundamental mass as you learn, you know, in, in really from, from, from grade one. Quark masses are more complicated. Quarks are not free. How can you measure something that is not free? Okay, if the quark is attached to something else, you can never measure the thing, okay? It's very hard to, to measure the mass of my hand, right? Because my hand is attached to my body, okay? So it's not so easy to say, how do we measure something that is not free particle, okay? There's a lot of subtleties here, but in, in short, well, the way we think about it is that we think about the mass as some parameter of the Lagrangian that is eventually related to some measurement that we do, okay? And let me say something, a little deep here that is philosophical, but I think it's important. The important point is that parameters are not physical, okay? The parameters of the standard model are not physical numbers. As you know, they, for example, they change uh, with, with the scale that we measure. What is physical is just measurements. And what we really use the parameters, there are some intermediate bookkeeping device that help us use one measurement to another, okay? For example, I can do the following uh, two ways to, to do the following experiment. I, actually, I'm going to do the experiment to you right now, OK? I have two different bodies in my hands. Can you see my experiment? So my, I do one experiment. I take this body. Let, let, let me, I want, uh, I cannot see myself. OK, I don't know why I cannot see myself. Anyway, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to make it to fall. I measure the time it took and I measure G and I get the value G equal 9.8, okay? I didn't really do it, but I know what I should have guessed, right? And then I take another body and I say, oh, I know that in theory, this body should have the acceleration gonna be MG. And I know what the G is. I mean, I want to measure the acceleration 
And I have a prediction. The prediction is that the G going to be 9.8. And I follow it and wow, it's the same. That's a prediction. Here I actually have to measure G, but you can do the same thing without the need to measure G, right? What I can say is that I fall and the acceleration of the second body will be the same as the acceleration of the first. And the acceleration of the fourth will be the first as the first, okay? I never have to measure G. All I'm saying is the acceleration of, from experiment one will be the result of the acceleration of experiment two. That's the way I like to think about parameters. Parameters are just intermediate steps in connection result of experiment one into result of experiment two. If you think about it, then fermion masses are just something, some parameter in the Lagrangian that help us connect one experiment to the other. Anyway, moving on, oops, moving on, I find that these are the roughly the values of the masses of the parameters. The mass of the electron, 511 kV, is roughly one MeV, which is 10 to the minus three GeV. The mass of the muon is roughly 100 MeV. The mass of the top quark is roughly is 174 GeV, and it's roughly 100 GeV. So what you see, and just stare at the numbers, and you see that these numbers are far from generic. There's really hierarchy. If you like, the exponents are generic, like minus one, zero, one, two, minus three, but not the numbers. The numbers are not generic, okay? So we learn already something really interesting here. A standard model, we can have any masses that we like, okay? For the standard model, the one that actually explains nature, there's a smallness and hierarchy in masses. And that's actually going to be very important when we're doing flavor physics, that a lot of the phenomena that we see in flavor physics are because of this feature of the standard model because masses are, ma are small and hierarchical in the standard model, okay? Good. So let me move to interactions. And first we're gonna talk about the interaction of the W boson and W boson couple the two components of a doublet, okay? For example, it give us something like muon coupled to, to a neutrino, a W and electron neutrino, and that's going to give us a muon decay. Using muon decay, we can measure the coupling constant G that appear here and here, okay? And also G Fermi, which is actually the effective four Fermi interaction that we get when we don't think about the W and its G Fermi. Again, I assume you've seen it before. I just want to emphasize it again. The W interaction involves only left-handed fields. It's violet parity because it's only involved left-handed field. And it's coupled the two components of the same doublet. It's the up, co up, up component and the down component of the doublet that are connected by a W. What about neutral currents? And the neutral current, we have the following somewhat complicated formula. We have the Z and the photon. The photon coupling is proportional to the charge of the fermion that it's coupled to. And the Z coupling is proportional to something a little more complicated is something that has to do with T3. T3 is the uh, Huygens value under applying the sigma three Pauli metrics on a doublet. So T3 on a singlet is zero, on a doublet is either plus one or a minus one, okay? And what we find uh, here is the following. That this Psi bar and Psi is the same Psi. We cannot have this coupling of the Z and the A do not couple something like say an electron to a muon. It's electron to electron, muon to muon, tau to tau, u bar to u, and up, type, up quark to up quark, down type to dark quark, et cetera, okay? The photon is coupling is parity invariant. It's coupled left and right the same. So we say that the photon coupling is vectorial. The Z coupling on the other hand is chiral because it have a different coupling to left hand and right handed field because the T3 is different. For the right-handed field, T3 is zero. For the left-handed field, the T3 is either plus half or a minus half, okay? And one other thing to note is that the coupling of the Z to the fermion is actually bigger than the coupling of the A. It's, a, a, it's enhanced by one over sinus, uh, oh, I forgot to write here theta W, one over sine theta W cosine theta W. So it's bigger than the one for the photon. So why call it a weak interaction? If actually the coupling is high, why we call it the weak interaction? 
And the answer is that because in everyday life, when we talk about seeing at the infrared, is the short distance nature of the Z. The fact that the Z is massive makes the force, the interaction very short distance, and therefore it's not important in uh, everyday life, or another way to say it, it's not important in uh, the infrared. And the last interaction that we have are the interaction of the Higgs, and the interaction of the Higgs with the fermions is uh, <clears throat> given by the following uh, thing, is the Yukawa interaction, and the Yukawa interaction is proportional to the Higgs, and I expand the Higgs around the minimum. So the minimum is V, and H is the Higgs field. And what we find, we find the following things, okay? We find that the coupling of the Higgs is the same as the mass matrix, because when the Yukawa interaction in any basis that the Yukawa interaction, I write it for, for the mass basis, it's also the interaction with the Higgs. I didn't say it right. What I wanna say is that the interaction of the Higgs, so this term give me H psi psi, H psi bar psi, which is the interaction term, and V psi bar psi, which is the mass term. And you see that both the Higgs interaction and the mass are proportional to the same mass matrix, to the same matrix Y. So when I diagonalize Y, I automatically also diagonalize the Higgs interaction. So what we find that the Higgs coupling is diagonal in the same basis where the mass is diagonal. So in particular, this Psi by Psi will only be electron, electron, muon, muon, tau, tau. I don't have a coupling of the Higgs field into a field that are different. So, that's what I was hoping to cover for today. And I was uh, happy to see that I'm basically on time. Um, and I guess we have one or two minutes for questions. So I, I will stop sharing. And if anybody have a question, please, I think at this point, you can just uh, open your, oh, there's one in the chat. Let's see if there's one question in the chat. Oh, sorry. Let me first answer the um, one question in the chat, and then we can. I think we have like one minute to, for question. I don't know if we have time, but hopefully we have. So what is the Fermi coupling constant? So the Fermi coupling constant is just a, just a numerical thing that go like G squared over MW squared. And the point is as following. When you actually write the, let, let me share again. All right. Share screen, share. Okay, let me move back to this and I will explain the point. So when you look at this Feynman diagram, you see that we have a muon decay. And this Feynman diagram, if you just write it, you have coupling here, which is G, G, and we have a propagator. And the propagator is one over MW squared minus Q squared. What is Q squared? Q squared is an extremely small number, because it can be at most, it can be the mass of the muon. And the mass of the muon is much smaller than the mass of the W, so you can neglect it. And when you neglect Q squared in the, in the propagator, then suddenly the propagator is not a is not uh, dynamic anymore. It doesn't have anything that depend on the dynamics of the decay. It's just one over MW squared. So it's just a pure number. So you see that the amplitude here is just a pure number. It's just D squared over MW squared. And this pure, pure number we call G Fermi, okay? And when we work at the at things that are, at energy that are much below the mass of the W, instead of writing the propagator, we can call this uh, G Fermi. Now, G, this is how we define G Fermi. Does it answer the question? I hope so. I know that the, that's always the problem of uh, giving those talks in Zoom, but I hope it did. Yeah. Okay, great, it did. Good. So I don't know if we have time for more questions. Oh, okay, Jim, you, you call it. Um, oh, yeah, you know, we certainly have a few minutes and it's a good question. It's asking about custodial okay. symmetry. Can you uh, briefly explain about custodial symmetry? So custodial symmetry, is the, it's an accidental symmetry of the Higgs sector of the standard model. So let me say a few things. So first let's talk about what is an accidental symmetry. I told you accidental symmetry emerge when we truncate a series, okay? So if I write my, uh, let's look at only on the Higgs potential. So the Higgs potential is the part of the Lagrangian that involves only the scalar, okay? And I write my scalar and I write phi squared, phi to the four. I cannot write phi cube because it's violate SU2. Phi cube, phi to the four, phi to six, five to eight, etc. When I truncated phi to the four, an extra symmetry emerged. Okay. 
The symmetry that I imposed was SU2 cross U1. And actually, when I truncate, you see that this sector of the theory has an accidental symmetry, of, which is actually a bigger symmetry, which is SO4. OK? This symmetry is accidental. That means that when I write phi to the 6, it's broken. When I write phi to the 6 term, I don't have this symmetry. And moreover, this symmetry is broken when I include other sectors of the theory. In particular, the Yukawa interaction and hyperpied interaction actually violate uh, this symmetry. And this symmetry are actually quite important when we actually talk about the electrolyte sector of the standard model, which is not the aim of this uh, lecture. So I will not uh, explore more. But I told you that we have the, the book that I'm writing. Um, in the book that, I'm, that uh, we are writing, we have chapter, chapter 12. And in chapter 12, we go into many details. And I hope it's explained in a nice way. So I really encourage you to go and read my book. I'm, I'm, I try to be a salesperson. I'm not. But uh, yes, you should actually get it. And for, this le for, for, to, for the flavor course that we are doing here, it's not very important. Any more questions? I know you've been for two hours. Uh... Yeah, it's a long, long session. Yes. But uh, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll be hearing from you later again today, Yuval. So if people think of anything, they can certainly come with their questions then. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer a question uh, later on. All right. So I, I think we can uh, close this first lecture here. And thanks a lot, Yuval. So...